Okay. It is 9.01 Pacific Standard Time. We're going to rock and roll. Um, welcome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining the second edition of Saturday Radvice. Um, so if uh, you have not joined us for one of these calls yet, uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of how this will uh, transpire. And if you were on the call two weeks ago, welcome back and thanks for joining once again. Uh, so the first 20 minutes or so, we'll be answering some questions that have been sent into us over the past few days. And then we'll reserve the last uh, about 10 minutes for some live questions. So please feel free to send me a direct message via the chat function that is at the bottom of your screen. Um, so I'm gonna start with some theory uh, for the most part sitting and then I'm gonna hop over and uh, show you guys some practical stuff, all right? So uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Kevin Hendry. I am the Director of Education for Radwiller. So I live in Vancouver, Canada, uh, even though uh, our head office is actually in Denver, Colorado. Um, I'm gonna start by answering uh, a quick question, actually. Somebody had asked, um, what is an osteopath practitioner? Um, so osteopathic practitioners are recognized by the World Health Organization around the world. And we are, if I'm going to give you the best uh, comparison, kind of like a physical therapist with extensive manual therapy training. So we certainly are in a different lane from them. But um, scope of practice wise, uh, it's a form of manual medicine, essentially. So I'm not a uh, physician. I do not perform uh, surgeries. I don't prescribe medication. But um, we do thorough history taking. And then we investigate uh, the structure and functions of the body. So we learn everything from head to toe, including the bones, the joints, all of the soft tissue. But we also learn how to assess uh, the cranial contents, your brain and all of its functions, uh, intraoral techniques for your jaw and your, uh, your mouth, um, as well as the organs. So literally every structure in the body, uh, we learn to uh, assess and to um, help treat. Also, just a special announcement, Rad Golf Level 1 is now live. Uh, that came out uh, just two days ago. So any of you golf fanatics, or if you do work with uh, uh, golf athletes, uh, please go check out radroller.com and take a look at that. We're very, very proud of uh, what's been put together. Uh, Nick Mueller uh, was the lead on that. And uh, special thanks to um, Roy and Chris and everyone else who had a hand in that. It looks awesome. All righty, on to topic list. Um, so I'll just quickly give you an overview, guys, so you can uh, see what to expect. Um, questions I'm going to run through. What are we actually doing when we foam roll or perform self-myofascial release? Are the positive results due to actual physical changes? Then we'll look at what direction or angle should be used to target specific muscles with a rad tool. Uh, three, if I'm using the rad roller to manage knee pain from osteoarthritis and joint swelling, is there anything that I should avoid? Next up, is there any way that the RAD tools can help manage sciatica? Um, what are the best stretches or exercises for hamstring mobility? And then lastly, what are the best release or stretching techniques for the neck and upper traps? Followed up with, is there any way that I can adjust my uh, neck on my own? If we have time, uh, I'll touch on uh, the modality of dry needling um, that uh, is performed by a physical therapist. All right, so on to some theory, guys. What are we actually doing when we foam roll or perform self myofascial release? Um, so this is an overview of the, uh, the accumulation of evidence, all right, the totality of evidence. This is not just our guess. We put in uh, all the research right up to date, and uh, here are the seven um, sort of best hypotheses of why it is so darn effective. So first up, increased stretch tolerance. So this is um, a decrease in pain or discomfort that we feel when we challenge the physiological barrier, or in other words, the end range of how far you can move a limb or, or tissues in your body. Um, also, descending inhibition, a very, very powerful uh, process that happens in the body. This is essentially pain relief of our brain releasing naturally occurring painkillers. So what's pretty cool is our own body can produce um, like oxytocin, serotonin, um, uh, all the um, norepinephrine, all of these opioids are painkillers, and they're like 10 times stronger 
than something you pop from a bottle that you got at the drugstore. Um, so believe it or not, using the RAD tools, we are tapping into this descending inhibition. Uh, the placebo effect, about 30% of the efficacy of all medication is actually the body, uh, the person believing it will actually do something, and that actually ramps up the effectiveness. So this is not something to shy away from and, and to say, well, it's BS, your system doesn't work. Well, no, anything that works has a placebo effect built in, and I think we need to actually maximize the placebo effect um, because it is so darn powerful. Uh, refreshing the somatosensory cortex. So getting a little technical here, but uh, to keep it simple, clearing pain-related defaults in the region of the brain that is receptive to the sense of touch. So it's kind of like we're hitting the reset button. So if every time I move my wrist, ah, that, that hurts. Well, we do a little bit of uh, self-myofascial release. Now we move, oh, gee, that, that feels different. It feels better. Uh, just a couple more here. Proprioceptive stimulation. So it's just a decrease in muscle tone due to um, a process called mechanotransduction. I suggest you just Google that or Google image it. I'm not going to go into the nitty gritty. Um, fluid change creates an opportunity to move. Now, here's an analogy I really like. Um, let's say you're out in the garden and you crank on the water pressure to full. It's a little tricky to move the hose. Well, if you turn the water off, you get all of the water out of the hose and there's no pressure. It's very easy to change its shape and to move around. So that's kind of similar to uh, our body. We are able to just kind of move around fluids a little bit, and that gives us an opportunity to challenge um, ranges of motion we didn't have before. And then lastly, this one's kind of controversial, just decreasing adhesions. Um, this is not what I think is most responsible. This is getting super local. Um, I like to take more of a global big picture approach, um, but we do have some research, Tozy 2012. Um, they found treatment in the abdominal region uh, very much improved sliding and gliding of tissues. So if you've had surgery, um, yes, doing SMR with the tools um, would absolutely be helpful because um, you are restoring some of that uh, capacity of the tissues to, uh, to just express their health. Now, global perspective for me, this is where I put all my chips. I'm saying this is why it's so darn effective. So we're zooming out, 30,000 uh, foot view. Um, this is research from Bialowski, 8 Al, 2009. You can check out that study. It's called the Mechanisms of Manual Therapy. Um, essentially what they concluded, um, they found manual therapy is so darn effective because the mechanical force, let's say I push into my masseter muscle in my jaw, that initiates a cascade of neurophysiological responses from the nervous system. And then your nervous system does a bunch of funky, cool stuff. You feel better, you can move better. Just to keep it very, very simple. All right, on to number two. What direction or angle should be used to target a specific muscle with a tool? Well, in the uh, image here, uh, you can see we have all of these different uh, forms and shapes of muscle. So what we recommend doing uh, with the RAD tools is start with going parallel to the muscle fibers or architecture. Um, if you've taken any sort of uh, kinesiology courses, you might remember the term penation. Muscle penation is kind of the direction the fibers run. So I'll give you an example of how I would handle two different types. Uh, so here we have the extensor digitorum in the forearm. This is a unipenate muscle. It's very simple. It shifts lines in one direction. So if I'm going to target this, I'm going to start parallel to the muscle fibers. And then eventually, let's say the next day or perhaps in a few days, once it's not quite as sore, then we're going to suggest doing more of a cross friction. And you're going to feel that that is uh, a fair bit more invasive, a little bit more intense. Now, looking at the pec major, this is what we call a convergent uh, uh, muscle architecture, it's kind of like a fan. So it starts narrow and then it goes from here and it goes broad. So in that instance, parallel to that uh, architecture would be parallel like this and go by feel. Everyone's going to be shaped and structured a little differently. And then if I were to go cross friction, I would progress towards this. And once again, I can feel, oh man, okay, that's, that's getting in there a little bit more. It's a little bit more of a, an aggressive approach. So that is dealing with muscle. 
Now, of course, we're not just dealing with muscle when we do SMR. Um, let's talk about fascia. Uh, this is a little bit different. So uh, research from a French surgeon uh, and an American uh, researcher, they found through the process of endoscopy, essentially they put a camera inside a living forearm and they saw what happened to the fascia. And they were able to see what happens to the, um, what's called the macrovacuoles, right? these kind of pockets of almost like a wet spider web that are always kind of melding and changing to external force and internal environment. So I'm just gonna minimize this. <clears throat> so here we have a video inside the forearm and essentially the traction is gonna be going that way. And uh, I'm gonna talk you through the five steps that happen over the course of two seconds. So this is a real takeaway here. When we're doing any work on the body, go much slower than you think you should be going. So it's gonna be freeze frame and phase A will come up. Boom, there's A. So what's happening here? 0.15 seconds, fibrils react immediately uh, to the stimulus, they quiver and um, they're, they're kind of fighting it. Boom, two, there's B. Fibers become unaligned in the direction of force as arrangement takes place. Again, they're sort of saying, nah, we don't really know what's going on here. We're gonna do our own thing. On to C. So now the fibers adopt certain movements that permit mechanical participation and submission to the external force. They're starting to go, all right, down and to the left, as you can see in the image here. Or uh, for those of you who can't see the picture, it would be towards the hand. Uh, D, as traction increases, fibers align themselves in the direction of the force. They start to submit and give way. And then E, finally, distant um, fibers start to join the party. So what is the point of all of this? Well, the take-home message is take the tissues where they do not go. Let me get back to the proper view here for you guys. There we go. Yeah, so take the tissues where they, they do not go. So if I investigate my form and I see, can I slide outwards, inwards, down towards the hand, up towards the elbow? Gee, I can't really take the fascia, the superficial fascia, up towards my elbow. So I'm gonna kind of pinch, or if I have a tool, I'm gonna to coax it in that direction that it does not go. And now visualize, over those two seconds, those five phases are happening. So it's not about harder the better, no pain, no gain, and it's not about just roughing it until it hurts. You know, really have some finesse when you're doing this uh, kind of stuff. Okay, number three, if I'm using the rod roller to manage knee pain from osteoarthritis and um, joint swelling, actually the question said uh, effusion, so they got a word point for there using a medical term, anything that I should avoid. Um, as with anything guys, this here, this interaction, I'm not giving you medical advice. Um, this is just a broad overview of some topics. So please always remember red flags, make sure we're being safe. So when in doubt, go get um, uh, investigated from a medical professional, okay? So of course, we need to watch for things like cancer, unfortunately, um, you know, like a blood clot. Um, so any numbness, tingling, extreme swelling, please go get it checked out. Um, but as long as everything is under control, you've kind of been given the go ahead by your physician or a clinician, um, I just have a few things to point out here. So here we have an image of the knee. Sorry about that, it's kind of graphic. Uh, but what I want you to pay attention to is above the knee is a suprapatellar fat pad, all right? So this structure often gets kind of squished together and then all of the other structures that are meant to slide and glide on top of it, doesn't really happen, everything's squished together. Um, we also have a subpatellar fat pad right below. So there's a the patella and it's right down through here. Well, if everything is stuck together, when I walk, when I run, when I play soccer, this knee joint is not really working optimally uh, from a biomechanical perspective. What this does is it affects drainage of fluids from the joint space. Now, if that takes place over two minutes, who cares, no problem. If that takes place over two years, 20 years, now we have a problem. Um, so the bursa sacs in the knee joint they often get really inflamed and swollen. They're meant to pump and kind of squish around and then everything gets drained out. 
in due time. Uh, well, one way of joint swelling, this process has kind of been um, hampered, if you will. Um, it's kind of like uh, we should have a nice free flowing river. It's kind of like, you know, a beaver dam is, is clogging it right in the middle. So drainage is affected. So what I would suggest is take that rad roller and spend some time on that fat pad above the knee and behind the knee. Also, we're going to turn our attention to the image on the right here. This is the back side of the knee. Okay. Um, to the point of the question, anything to be careful of? Well, in that kind of web space, I'll just show you here, right in the back side, don't put too much pressure there because we have some very delicate uh, blood vessels and nerves. So if you're poking around in there and you feel like things are going numb, ease off and stop and move a little bit. Even moving a centimeter uh, should take off um, that sort of sensation. But um, right below uh, kind of that web space and behind the knee, uh, there's a muscle called the popliteus. And uh, it kind of runs at an at a oblique or diagonal angle. I suggest spending some time there on the back side of the knee. That is going to be very, very helpful uh, for uh, kind of restoring that normal drainage. Okay, on to four. Is there any way that the tools can help manage sciatica or IT band issues? So first, let's uh, start with sciatica. Uh, what is it? Well, it uh, essentially occurs when there's compression or irritation of the sciatic nerve. And um, sciatic nerve is not one nerve. It is uh, five different segments of nerves um, from L4 in the low back, L5, S1, 2, 3, which is in your sacrum, which is that bone right there. Cool fact, how did the sacrum get named? Well, back in the, you know, like Roman era, I, I believe is when it uh, occurred, uh, they found when there was war in the battlefield, the last bone of the body to decompose was the sacrum, so they called it sacred. So this is kind of a cool tidbit for you. Um, but the side nerve, like I said, is this blend. Um, they meet to form one large bundle, which runs through the buttocks and uh, runs all the way down the entire length of the leg. Uh, it's actually the longest and widest nerve in the body, and it has sensory and motor function, meaning it affects how you feel in that entire region, and also it affects how you can function and actually move uh, the limb. 10% um, roughly of the population, this sciatic nerve actually runs through a muscle called the piriformis, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so if the piriformis muscle is tight, it kind of clamps down on the nerve, and then that can really uh, cause some symptoms. Also interesting uh, note, piriformis syndrome, which is kind of this cascade of problems from a tight muscle, um, affects more women than men. Uh, it's been found to be like a six to one ratio. So here we have an image. So often, the problem is actually up here at the spine, but people typically don't feel it in the, in the vertebrae. They actually feel it in the, you know, in the pelvis, in the butt area, or they're getting some problems down the leg. Um, so really the key here is you can do a lot of manual release, working on your low back, working on your, your hip, working on the length of the entire chain down to your foot. Um, but again, back to the point of being safe, um, I do recommend going and getting um, uh, assessed. Get a trained professional to determine, is it due to muscle spasm or is it something going on at the disc, which might require uh, a little bit more um, uh, guided uh, intervention, if you will. All right, so what can we do about it? Uh, I'm gonna show you guys a few techniques. Let's get active. So I'm just gonna change positions here. So first up, piriformis. So I'm gonna use a, um, a recovery round and you'll see the piriformis goes from the sacrum to the head of the femur and it, it runs it kind of like a diagonal. So imagine it's like um, you're wearing jeans, picture where your jean pocket would be and it runs diagonally like that. Sorry, that way. All right, so my favorite way to hit that, recovery round. I'm just going to have a seat on a chair, or I can do it on the floor on the uh, rad block. And I like to start at the ball and socket of the hip. You can move the, uh, across the whole length of the muscle all the way up to the sacrum. So you don't want to be pushing on bone. 
And again, back to um, following direction. If I'm going to do like a parallel flush, I'd be going in that direction. Cross friction would be like so. Or in our courses, um, Rad Mobility Level 1, you'll learn one of our go-to techniques is called the pin and hold, where we simply find origin or insertion, and we just hang out there. And we take 10 deep breaths, and um, we just kind of let the tool do the work. All right. Next up. Hey, Dev, uh, this is Rad Ruler. Rad Ruler, we're going to go right here in the low back. So L5, S1. This is a very common spot to be compressed. Hey, Kevin. Yes. Can you uh, lower the camera angle for us? Oh, thank you, sir. Yeah. I can't see my screen. That should work well. Thank you. That better. Thanks, Roy. All righty, guys. Yes, my uh, vertebrae are smack dab in the middle of the contour of the rad roller. And what I like to do here is just do a little bit of a glue bridge. I'm rolling my bum off the floor. You're going to feel that that is still keeping contact of the tool, but I'm increasing pressure into the tool. So we can do, let's say, 10 deep breaths as we're doing this motion, or I like to drop the knees side to side. And this is getting the sacrum bone as well as your spine to rotate. All right. So those would be two of my go-to tech, go techniques, pardon me. Uh, for um, sciatica issues. Now, if we're talking about how do we do a follow-up? Well, in our courses, you know, what we teach, we don't just end there. Um, we're going to instruct you to move. Um, so for this, uh, we're going to review a very simple uh, nerve flossing technique. All right. So I'm just going to use a towel because I had it laying around. You can certainly use a skipping rope or um, like a proper TheraBand from the gym. So let's say it's the right side of my leg, my hip, my low back has been giving me issues. Like so, I'm on my back. I've got my, my leg totally supported. I'm going to plant or flex, meaning I point my foot downwards. And then I just find a spot where I can feel a nice, deep sort of sensation in that nerve, that sciatic nerve. And I'm doing a very slow, gentle sort of floss. Okay, so we can do that for a few minutes and uh, really just go by feel. And, um, you know, when you retest, how's that feeling? You should uh, get a fair bit of relief. Alrighty, what are the best release or stretching techniques for the neck and the upper traps? Any way that I can adjust my own neck? Well, let's start with that. If you're one of these people that loves to crack your own back or your own neck, let's see if I can get it this morning. No, I can't. Um, if you are getting that pop or that cavitation, it is likely not a segment that you want to be adjusting. It's probably a joint segment that is hypermobile, meaning it has too much range of motion. And one of the segments a little bit above or a little bit below is actually truly stuck. So to properly uh, adjust your neck, you do need a trained professional to assess what joint is blocked and they're going to have to stack up all these parameters and uh, really give it that force. Um, so unfortunately, I don't really recommend, um, you know, doing the head, head or neck cracks throughout the day, um, but you can certainly use the rad tools. And um, if you have a tight, stiff neck, you've been doing a release of your neck in this region here, I do that twice a day. I do that every morning and every night before bed. Uh, phenomenal, but um, kind of a missing link is the spinal accessory nerve. So look at this, uh, this yellow pathway here. Um, it's one of the cranial nerves, and uh, it's called cranial nerve 11. It functions the upper traps. So I'm going to show you a little bit of variation of doing a neck release, where we're actually going to target freeing up the soft tissue that lays above uh, that spinal accessory nerve, and those chronic tight traps that just aren't going away. This is almost like taking the foot off the gas pedal. Uh, I almost promise that you're going to have some amazing results with this. So, here would be the standard kind of uh, suboccipital release. I'm just under the occiput or the bone of my head. There we are. I can do pin and hold and just hang out here. 
I can do little chin tucks and head extensions. I can do a little bit of a rotation right to left to see what side feels a little bit more tender and restricted. And I've had, been having some issues on my right side. So let's show you that. So now I'm gonna line my side using the contour of the ball and I'm going under the, what's called the mastoid of the temporal bone. So there's this kind of bony ridge on like the, the outside of the head here. And you are just gonna gently relax, let your head float, let the tool do the work, relax your jaw, deep slow breaths. And this is actually gonna be really helping out um, any sort of compression and tightness over that cranial nerve 11, which affects downstream. All right, so that's something you may not be doing that is gonna be an absolute game changer. How are we doing for time? 9.25, doing good. Um, now a thought on uh, dry needling. Um, I'll quickly touch on that. Uh, yeah, I, I've had experience getting dry needling uh, years ago for um, extreme arm uh, form tightness and I found it was extremely powerful. Um, pros and cons, pros, it's, it's very safe. It's very quick. I mean, results are almost instantaneous. I like to describe it as almost like getting that tight hypertonic muscle that's like overworked and really aggravated. By putting in one of those needles, it's a little bit thicker than a traditional acupuncture needle and doing like a piston technique.